We're going to continue in our series, We the People. We just have a couple more weeks. And before we do, I want to give you a kind of a heads up of what's to come in the next couple of weeks. We're really excited. As you heard, last, next week is going to be baptisms. Man, if you have not been baptized, that is your next step. If I could just be as lo- loving but passionate about it and just encourage you, your next step is to go public with your faith through water baptism. Like that is your st- next step. My wife, she told her story. She was raised Catholic and she was baptized as a baby, but she decided this past year, man, I have to, I have to take this step for myself to go public as an adult and say, man, I choose Jesus. And I got to baptize my wife this past year. And maybe that's some of your stories. But if you haven't taken that next step next week, man, that is your that is your opportunity. But in two weeks, we're going to start a brand new series. It's going to be called Break the Mold. And me and my wife, we're actually going to do a team teaching. And it's going to be a lot of fun. And you don't even have to be married. Um, we believe that so many people are so worried about finding the right person. And me and wife, my wife believe, man, if you would just focus on being the right person, God will take care of the rest. So many people in our generation, man, I'm telling you, we're going to be talking about how to forgive easily. We're going to be talking about how to be, um, how to not take up offense. Man, this generation is so easy to offend, man. You say something so small or if you just do the wrong thing, they take offense. And I'm like, man, that is going to destroy your relationships. Every relationship, there's going to be no perfect relationship, no perfect person, no perfect church. Amen. And so we're going to be talking about that. So me and my wife, it's going to be a lot of fun. So please mark your calendars in two weeks. We're going to uh, we're gonna dive in into a new series. But tonight we're going to continue in our series, We the People. But before we do, I just wanted to honor Hannah who she's in the the middle of this I just I know she doesn't like when I do this but Hannah's our music director she covers all our vocals all the music her and her husband Wes on the drums he was spending all afternoon getting the tracks ready and I just want to let them know man you could tell a lot about um, people by just longevity And their character, they've been with me for um, around seven years or something like that. And I always tell people all the time that I feel like I get to be with them. You know, I just can't believe that they let me and Alicia and our family be a part of their lives. And they've meant so much to us over the years. And for me and Alicia, the longer we serve together, I mean, this is just how it is around here. Uh, It doesn't get like more boring. It gets more exciting. And every single time I see them, um, I just just appreciate them. And I just appreciate Hannah and Wes so much. And can we give them a hand? I mean, they're just incredible, incredible people. Beyond just the gifts that they serve Five Culture with, uh, they are just a gift themselves. And so I just appreciate them all these years just hanging with us. So we love you guys so much. We're going to continue in We The People series. And um, this has been so much fun. Um, because we've been taking values of what makes us us and we've been diving into the Bible because everybody told me as a church planter, you have to start your church off by something practical, fun, do something silly, don't get too deep. I just kept telling them, I was like, that's not us. Like we, we, we love the Bible and we wanna unpack the Bible. If that means we grow a little bit slower, so be it. But man, we're gonna be a Bible church, amen. And so the things that make us us, we wanna make sure they're values that Jesus cares about. And so we've been taking things, like the first week we talked about Jesus is central in everything we do. And so we were like, what does that look like? And then the week after that, we said we were talking about serving and serving others is our privilege, right? That means all people from all political backgrounds, all racial backgrounds, we want to serve people. And last week we talked about people are our hearts and we will fight for people, all people. And we will fight for babies all the way up to senior citizens. We just love people. And Tonight, I'm so excited because when we begin to study these values, you begin to understand that these values were something that Jesus cared deeply about. Like we love people because Jesus loved people. We serve people well because Jesus served people well. We give extravagantly, why? Because God gave extravagantly to us when he sent Jesus down over 2000 years ago to live a sinless life die and come back to life again. So that's why we give every single value that we talk about, we see in the life of Jesus. And I love this so much because when you become a follower of Jesus, you realize your life is not your own anymore, but we are simply vessels in the hand of an incredibly good God for him to do whatever he wants in and through us. And when I was growing up, I grew up in a very traditional church and it seemed like all the values they had were from like bumper stickers, you know? So they used to tell me stuff like that. They used to say, you know what, Brian, don't be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. I don't know if you've ever heard that before. Don't be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. And then that sounded great until I started reading the Bible for myself. I'm like, that's actually not biblical. 
Because the more you read the Bible, the more heavenly minded you are, the more earthly good you become, amen? Because you focus that every single thing we do on this planet has a purpose. I love what C.S. Lewis said. He was a pastor and theologian. He said it like this. He said, if you read history, you will find that Christians who did the most for the present world were precise, precisely those who thought the most of a next. You know, I'm gonna be honest with you tonight. Um, there are a few quirks about me that you're gonna discover. And here at Vibe Culture, we just like to keep it real. We just like to have real talk. So one of the things that I hate doing, and maybe you can relate to this, is I hate sharing my food and drinks. And anybody else like that? Like, I hate it. Like, I have, six, I got an applause. Like, wow, that's a serious person. Like, I don't like sharing food, but I have six kids. It's inevitable. You know, like, they're just gonna pick at my food. But drinks, I think that's one of the most disgusting things when people take my drink. And my wife thinks it's hilarious. Like, one of the, I love pop. I'll just say it. I love pop. It's one of the things I love. Everyone has their thing, coffee, lattes, you know, sweets, chocolate. I'm not a sweets person. I just like pop. You know, so my wife, when we were earlier, when we were married, she would, you know, always give me the, you know, rundown. It's going to kill you. It's going to destroy your inside. I'm like, can you just like, now she lets me enjoy it. But you know what bothers me? It's that every single time I have a pop, she seems to want to drink out of my drink. And she always like drinks it. She's like, ah, that's disgusting. I'm like, there's a real easy way for you not to have that taste in your mouth right now. Like, don't drink my drink. And you know, my wife and my girls, they'll drink it all the way down to the ice cubes. Does anybody know what I'm experiencing up here? You know, it's like, ah, I had the perfect amount and they don't refill it. I hate it. I hate, especially with my sixth born. Uh, he's a disgusting eater and a disgusting drinker. He's two. He's two years old. So when he drinks, he just drinks and spit. I'm just like, this is awful. I also hate sharing my bed with my kids at night. I don't know if you're like that because my kids snuggle with my wife and they slap and kick me all night. I don't know what it is. It's like something programmed in him. And I have this like quirk now because when my, my third born, when he was two, one time I rolled over and I didn't realize that he was butt naked with no pants on and my tip of my nose hit his butt cheek. And it was this, I woke up like mad. I was like, she's like, what's wrong? I was like, his butt cheek just grazed the tip of my nose. That's wrong. That is so wrong. So I always sleep with like one eye open now. It's like, it's, it's a weird, I hate it. I hate sharing my bed, but the most thing I hate out of everything, and I hope I get one amen in this building, is I hate sharing my toothbrush. Uh, thank you. The Lord is in this place. He really is. I think it's the most disgusting thing in the entire world for people to share a toothbrush. Now, if that's you, I'm not, you do you. You know, they might, we might have a Jesus moment at the end, but I, it's, I think it's, so when they say, hey, dad, can I borrow your toothbrush? No. Like, they, like that's where I, the toothbrush and deodorant. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's mine. And so my second born, like three days ago, she knows the rule. I'm not generous with my toothbrush. She's like, Dad, um, please, I have to go to dance. Can I please use your toothbrush? I'm like, no. She's like, Dad, it's been, mine's been lost since yesterday. I'm like, that's a problem. So I'm like, one, well, it's been 32 hours. Like, that's, that's no. She's like, please, I don't want to go to, I was like, you're going to have to deal with whatever funk is in your mouth right now. That's going to be your punishment because I am not sharing my toothbrush. Can I get one more amen? That's like a, that's a solid amen. We all have things in our lives that we're not generous with, right? But one of the things for us, one of the values for us at Vibe Culture is generosity is a privilege for us. And so tonight, I want to, in the, in the most pastoral, like a fatherly way, walk us through the Old Testament through the New Testament and see why this value is so important to the heart of God. You see, if we didn't care about, you know, making sure that we preached in a holistic view, we would just take a couple verses and preach on that. But I feel like that would be doing the, this, this value in particular a disservice because it's so important for us to get a holistic view of this idea what generosity really is. So usually we spend time, 99% of the time in one place. We go verse by verse. We do like, a, you know, we do a character. But tonight I want to take you on a journey through the Bible and see how this value started all the way back into the book of Genesis. We say it like this around here, generosity is our privilege. We don't give because we have to, 
We give because we get to. We give because it makes a difference. I love this. We give for those who are to come. We give because of what's been given to us. We are blessed to be a blessing. Amen. Proverbs eleven twenty four through 25 says it like this. The world of the generous gets larger and larger, but the world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. The one who blesses others is abundantly blessed. Those who help others are helped. And so you're going to see a little bit tonight God's heart on this idea of generosity. And this is so important to our culture because it reveals who the rightful owner of it is anyways. You're going to see by the end of this that it has nothing to do with our money or possessions. What it really has to do with is our character and our hearts. What do we really worship? Image, success, insecurity, materialism, consumerism. And so I want you to know tonight, before we even dive into the Bible, I wanted to be very clear that here at Vive Culture, we don't want anything from you. We want everything for you. Every promise, every blessing, every favor that God has over your home and over your life, we want for you. We did not plant Vive Culture to use people to build ministries. We planted Vive Culture so we would build ministries to build up people. And that is a huge huge difference. And so as we begin to unpack this, you're going to realize and hopefully maybe be reminded for the first time that you exist for the glory of God. He does not exist for us. And I just want to, before I read the first verse, just just kind of relax, you know, tonight that we're not taking up a second offering. We're not doing a building campaign. We're not doing any of that. Tonight's value is just something that we value around here because one day, we're going to be so open-handed with everything you have. You look around and there's some empty seats. One day there's not going to be an empty seat in the place. One day we're going to be so generous with our music from Vive Culture Music. We're going to be so generous with our kids' ministry. We're going to so be so generous with what we have. And it starts right now with being faithful. Matthew 6.33 says it like this, But seek first, but seek first, that's a key word, the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things shall be added to you. If we're going to start anywhere, we have to seek first his kingdom, which is the primary subject of the Sermon on the Mount when you begin to study the life of Jesus. And when we say seek, that word seek in the Bible means chase after, pursue, be so intentional to running after his ways, his principles first, and all these things will be added to you. So I want to take a journey in the Bible and I want us to get to the end of the place where we're so excited about this idea of generosity. We're so excited about what God has given us that we can't wait to see how he uses it for his kingdom because it's not a money issue. It's a worship issue. And so let's start in Genesis 4, verse 2. This is what it says. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep. But Cain was a tiller of the ground. So right there, it tells you two people, two different gifts, two different ways of making income. And in the process of time, that's huge. You're going to see a lot of underlying words. In the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruits of the ground to the Lord. That word brought is key. You're going to see that from cover to cover over and over again. Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. Listen to this. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. It would be like if someone talks about money and all of a sudden it's like arms crossed, like I can't believe they're talking about money. Like that, like that spirit fell on him. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, Will you, not be expe- uh, will you not be accepted? If you do not do well, sin lies at your door and it's easy and it's desires for you, but you shall rule over it. Now this is huge to laying the foundation because instantly you see two men had two different ways of pre- bringing income into their lives. It would be like if you started the, at the bottom of your company, like you were at the very bottom, you begin to work your way up. That's what we begin to see with Cain enables life. And you see, it says, in the process of time. You know what that means? That means that, uh, whenever they got around to it. 
it wasn't really that important. Like, you know, like, yeah, whenever we figure it out, like, oh, I didn't get to it. Like, I'll get to it. He just brought an offering. And notice what it says. God didn't just reject his offering. Do you know what he said? It said he rejected Cain, the man. When you begin to study Cain's life, Cain was a very, he had a very evil heart. So you realize even before the law was even written, God was after people's hearts. But then you look at Abel's life and it shows that Abel brought the first. He brought the best of the first and of their fat. And he said, not only just does he accept the offering, he had respect for Abel. So much so that in Matthew, Matthew 23, 35 centuries later, when Jesus was speaking to hypocrites and religious people, this is what he said. He called Abel righteous Abel. Just think about that for a second. Centuries later, Jesus was like righteous Abel. That's how much he valued what he brought to him because they brought an offering. So early on, even in the beginning of the scripture, we see that God is beginning to lay this blueprint for generosity. And I wanna continue to move through the Bible. New day and age, new leadership, same message. Exodus 6, 6 through 7 says this, therefore God said to the Israelites, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will, you're seeing the key, th the key theme, I will take you out as my own people and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. This is what he's saying. He's like, I know the propensity in human hearts. I know once you start getting success, once you get that raise, once you get that family, once you get those kids, we have this propensity in all of our hearts to take credit for all the good days and blame God for all the bad days. But what he's saying is before I give you armies, before I give you real estate, before I give you lands and families, I want to remind you that it is me. I'm the one that's freeing you. I'm the one that has allowed you to have that family. I'm the one that has caused you to have that gift so you can have that job. Yeah, you are a steward of it, but I'm the one that gave you the mind to process information. People say, well, it's my gift. No, God gave you the mind for that gift. That breath you just took right now was God's generosity on your life. And so he's saying, I don't want you to forget like a dad when he tells his kids 10 times, like, you know, take out the trash, take out the trash, God, dad, I got it. No, I know when you leave this place, you're going to forget. I want to remind you, take out the trash. It's the same way he's reminding them that it's because of me that you're about to have what you have. And I want to make sure I'm number one in your hearts. The Bible says that God owns a th the cattle on a thousand hills. It's not about money. It's about our hearts. And so we continue to move, and we're going to move through the Old Testament into the New Testament. In Exodus 13, in the Old Testament, starting in verse 1, says this, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, who was over this nation now, saying, Consecrate to me all the firstborn. There's that word again. Whatever opens the womb among the children, both man and beast, it is mine. Now that word in Hebrew is so strong when it says mine. It means that I am the owner. And notice the Lord says that is set apart for me. It's the first. This, this value tonight that we're talking about church, we call it the first fruits principle, which means when we trust him with the first of everything we have, we believe that God sees that as a, a step of faith. And he's saying, I'm gonna, that's a, it's a worship issue. It's a trust issue. It's a faith issue. And so many people get hung up on the amount or the number. And I tell people all the time, man, he's not after an amount. He's after your hearts. Because generosity, as you see in a few moments, it moves from a have to to a get to. Because that's what he's really after. And I love that God didn't wait for us to get our act together be, but before sending his best, amen, because he sent his best, which is Jesus. And the Bible says, yet when they were still sinners, Christ died for us. And now we continue to move in this journey because we're gonna see how serious God is with his value of generosity is our privilege. I love this. 
Man, I just picture our church in these verses, Exodus 36, three through six, and now they're doing it God's ways. They're bringing it first, and this is what it says. They received from Moses all the offerings the Israelites had brought to carry out the work of the constructing the sanctuary, which means they were all building his house together. And the people continued to bring, there's that key word again, free will offerings morning after morning, which means there's no drive bag guilt trips. Nobody's knocking on their tent saying, hey, you're giving, you're not giving, none of that. Free will offerings. And it said, so all the skilled workers who were doing all the work in the sanctuary left what they were doing and said to Moses, oh, I love this. The people are bringing more than enough for doing the work the Lord commanded to be done. Then Moses gave an order and they sent out this word throughout the camp. Listen to this. No man or woman is to make anything else as an offering for the sanctuary. And so the people were restrained from bringing more because they already had was more than enough to do the work. What a great problem to have for a church. You know, like the next two weeks, nobody give anything because we have to, we need a minute to figure out how to get this. It's so much is coming in. We got to figure out a way to get it out. And I love this so much because God is always about building his house, building his church. And you're going to stay with me because you're going to see how this is going to translate and to the New Testament covenant, because most people, most people who fight this value say things, that's old school, that's Old Testament, we're not under the new, you know, the old covenant anymore. And I say, that's true. But Jesus did not come to do away with the Old Testament. What does the Bible says? He came to fulfill it. So it's not like we just do away with the Old Testament. There's a reason. The Old Testament is pointing us to the New Testament. And it's so funny, those same people who love to say that, just quote Jeremiah 29, 11, right? It's in the Old Testament. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to bless you, prosper you, give you a new hope and a future. Man, how we like to just pick and choose the Old Testament verses. However, that verse is one of the most misquoted verses in the entire Bible. Because that verse was not spoken to a person. It was spoken to a nation. And there were 70 years of hardship before they received that promise. So we might want to get some context to the verses we're speaking over our lives and the verses we're willing to die on. But either way, I tell people all the time that the Old Testament is pointing people to the New Testament. And you're going to, be, you're going to see this momentum shift as we continue in this journey together. Exodus 23, 19 says, The first... Of the first fruits of your land, you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God. Now it's becoming obvious, like it's so obvious that we are to bring the very first into the hearts, into the house. Why? Because we know we are. We will self-justify it. We will find other ways to spend it. And God is continually saying, "Bring, bring." Why does He say "bring" instead of "give"? because you can't give what doesn't belong to you. You see, my father-in-law, he's one of the most generous guys you'll ever meet. He's, he's incredible. Him and my mother-in-law, they serve here at Vibe. My mother-in-law is just a bubbly smile that usually you see when you walk through the doors. She just has amazing personality like my wife. My father-in-law, he's awesome. He's one that helps us with hosting. I think he's at our house right now because our lights are out. Like, he just serves. He's just amazing. And anything he has, he gives. And so when we were pulling the trailer for our church, we asked him, he has a work truck. We said, hey, Steve, would you mind if we pull your trailer? I'm like, no problem. Here's the spare keys. Keep them. I'm like, that's trust. You're like, you're giving me the spare keys to your truck. And he's like, whatever you need, whatever you need, it's, it's yours. And so I took it. And so what if, though, what if Steve was like, hey, Brian, I have a, I have a work project on Monday. I'm just going to need my work truck back. And what if I was like, ah, Steve, I'm not sure if that's going to work out for my calendar very well. You know, I have some stuff going on. Like, I'll give it back when I can. He'd be like, dude, give it back? No, you're, you're bringing his truck back because you're not the one that owns it. He does. He makes the payments. He pays the insurance. He's the owner. He just lent it to you. It's the same way when you begin to study scripture, there's only two options that we have when it comes to our first fruits. We either bring it or we steal it. And so this is such a value for God's because it has nothing to do with possessions or a dollar amount. It has to do with the gods that we worship. 
It has to do with the things that we cling to. You see, I love that verse that we spoke in the beginning that the world of the generosity gets larger and larger because generosity is the cure for materialism. It allows us to cling to Jesus and say, man, whatever I have, Jesus is yours. And so as you begin to continue through this journey, you begin to see that he's so serious in the verbiage that he uses. Leviticus 27:30 says this, and all the tithe, tithe just means 10th, and all the tithe of the land, whether the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree is the Lord's. It is holy. Holy just means it is set apart. It is holy to the Lord. David understood this so much that in 2 Samuel 24, 24, if anyone had a way to just justify it, if anyone had an outlet, a, a loophole to just kind of like say like, ah, he doesn't really mean it, it was David. And he had his opportunity to take a shortcut. And this is what he said. He said, I will not sacrifice to the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. Because he understood it was not a money issue, it was a character issue. Proverbs 3, 9, just two more verses and we'll begin to move into the New Testament where it gets fun. Proverbs 3, 9 through 10 says this, honor the Lord with your possessions, which means that it is an honor issue. And with the first fruits of all your increase, so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. This is not saying, man, when you give, you're just gonna get so much money in return. No, it's talking about a quality of life. It's talking about a heart posture. It says, and with its first fruits and all your increase, you know what that's talking about? That's talking about everything that comes into your home. Honor God with that. You see, it wasn't so different back then like it is today in 2018. Back then, they had the same kind of life. They had different things that they brought income into the home. So some people would be farmers, and then at nighttime, they could like what? They could like be like, uh, they could plant vegetables, and then maybe someone in the house, like maybe they had two incomes, and they made bread, and then maybe someone in their home sold clothes, um, sewed clothes, and they sold them. It's the same thing like today. You have maybe two incomes and then some people have side hustle, right? They sell oils or they do something with this gift and everything that brings increase into your home. God says, man, that is what, that is what you honor me with. Don't just pick the least amount and just say, ah, oh, we're, gonna, we're gonna tithe off this, but everything else is going to the 401k, the bills. No, he say, honor me with everything that comes in he, and I'm gonna take care of you. I'm gonna take care of your family. I'm gonna take care of your finances. I'm gonna take care of your health. Trust me with it. Because what generosity comes down to, it's an honor issue. Last verse and we'll move into the New Testament. This is God speaking to his people in Malachi 3, eight through 10. And we're still under the old covenant. It's a have to still. It's a have to. It says, will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what ways have you robbed me? In the tithes and the offerings, for you have robbed me. Even this whole nation, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and try me on this, says the Lord of hosts. And see if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. This is not talking about if you give more, you'll get more. This is again talking about trust. And there's two different false theologies that people have been preaching for the last, especially the last decade. It's the prosperity theology and the poverty theology. The prosperity theology is the more you give, the more God loves you. The more you give, the more God's gonna bless you with money. And the other one is the poverty theology that the less you have, the more God loves you. And neither one of those are in the Bible. You know what it talks about? Man, it talks about stewardship, amen? It talks about being faithful. There were rich people in the Bible like Luke. We talked about him last week. He was a doctor by profession. He was one of the main reasons why church plants and uh, movements got to move forward. He just saw his, I mean, he was an amazing man. And then you see people that God gave kingdoms to, that he gave armies to. And then you see people in the middle class, you see poor people. It has nothing to do with a, a tax bracket. What it has to do is faithfulness. And then you begin to move into the New Testament, man. This is where I get fired up because Jesus changed everything. Jesus changed everything. He, moved, he made it from a, a have to, from law to a get to, to moving under grace. Because now all of a sudden they have this relationship, this, this revelation. And they're like, okay, I got Jesus. 
Like, are you kidding me? Like all the mysteries that's been revealed, like we talked about the first week, every promise and blessing is yes and amen in Christ. You mean I don't have to go to a priest to ask for forgiveness? You mean every single thing in my past is forgiven? Are you kidding me? Yes. You can have it all. You have my marriage. You have my kids. You have my career. You have my calling. You get it all. Because it moved now from a have to to a relationship. And I love this because when you begin to now read in the Bible in the New Testament, oh my gosh, I get so fired up because it moved from law to grace. And so many times people say, I don't see the 10% in the New Testament. Do you have to? Do you? Because it, it was already as clear as day as we just read some of the verses. But now all of a sudden it's like, no, that's the floor. That's not the ceiling. You begin to realize that everything they had now is to be used to impact people's lives. I love it so much because now when we're teaching my sixth born son, he's two, we have to tell him, wrap your, wrap your arms around daddy. Tell daddy you love him. No, look me in my eyes. Tell me you love me. He doesn't want to. Tell me. Wrap him. Wrap him. Squeeze tight. Say, I love you, daddy. Can you imagine if I did that to my 12-year-old? You know how awkward that would be? No, it's so amazing that now my kids, they get it. They're like, man, I just give my dad a hug and a kiss and say, thank, I appreciate you, dad. They just snuggle up to me every day. Just, dad, you know how much I just, you just mean so much to me. It's a relationship thing now. It has nothing to do with have to. It has to do with get to. And look what happens in the Bible. I love this so much because me and my wife desired to pastor a church that's so generous, that's so open-handed, that we have so much that we get to pour out that people say like, what in the world is going on there? And we just say, man, this is something that just, this is who we are. Because generosity is a privilege. And it's understanding biblical stewardship. Listen to this, 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says, so, le so let each one now give as he purposes in his heart, which means you have to have a plan. There has to be a strategy, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. That means wholeheartedly. That word cheerful in the Greek means hilariously. God loves a hilarious giver. He wants everything from us, from us because it's an honor issue. We know the blueprint in the Old Testament. We understand that it's a first fruits thing. It's an honor thing. But in the New Testament, man, look what happens when God's people do it his way. Acts 4. 34 through uh, 35 as we begin to wrap up. Nor was there anyone among those who lacked. For all who were possessors of land or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet and they distributed each one as he had need. This is not talking about everyone go home and sell all your stocks, all your farms, all your houses. That's not what it's talking about. Again, what it's talking about is a first fruits thing. And look what happens as we begin to do things God way, God's way. Just picture vibe culture in these verses in 2 Corinthians 8, 1 through 7. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given to the Macedonian churches. So I, I picture vibe culture in this. In the midst of very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich, what's that word? Generosity. So that when it says poverty, that means that bills are piling up. It's, it's slow economically. Like things don't necessarily make sense, but for some reason they were overflowing joy. And look what it continues to say. It says, for I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. Again, you see there's no guilt trips. They urgently pleaded with us, listen to this, for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first to all the Lord and then by the will of God also to us. This is what it's saying. It's saying like so many people here at Vibe Culture, Lord, thank you so much that I get to be a part of what God's doing. Thank you. We hear our team members all the time. We just honor each other. We try to our best to create a culture of honor. And every single week we get text messages or inboxes or man, thank you for the privilege of allowing us to build what God is building here at Vive Culture. And so tonight, the challenge for us is to be faithful stewards. Maybe for some people, you're like, man, I haven't even taken, taken that step of faith. Man, tonight is a great time to say, man, whatever's going on in my life, I'm going to be faithful. Because when you begin to hold back, when you begin to hide, that's when problems come. 
Because the Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you. The problem is, is when we begin to hold on to things. We see in the book of Joshua in chapter eight, there was a man named Achan that took what didn't belong to him and he hid it underneath his tent. In our day and age, that would be like they kept it in the bank account or they just didn't step out. Whatever gift you have, you're like, I'm not ready to step out. They just kept it for themselves. Some of you have a gift of leading worship or impacting kids or whatever the case may be and you're still holding on to it. God's like, man, what are you waiting for? And Achan hid it under his tent. And you know what happened? His entire family paid for it. And an entire nation at that time began to lose the battle, which means people died until they figured out what happened. They cleared it up, they fixed it, and they began to have victory again in their life. Another extreme example in the New Testament, when a man, married couple named Ananias and Sapphira kept back what belonged to God, it didn't work out very well for their family. This is what I tell, especially married couples, I wanna challenge you. The only time you really see where people hide things in the Bible is when they're ashamed or they're trying to keep something hidden. I tell people all the time that as a married couple, every, you should know exactly what you're bringing in every single month. There should be no secrets because one of the biggest reasons why people get divorced is finances and there should be no secrets. Like your spouse should know like exactly how much you make. There shouldn't be any like secrets. They should know like, man, how much did we bring in this month? Like our bonuses, whatever. How much are we tithing off of that? Are we being faithful? Believe me, there've been times where like there was, it was tight and my, I told my wife and she knows exactly, she can say, hey, how much is in our bank account? She knows the password, no secrets. There's no secrets. And there's been times where I've been, I've been fearful at times and I'm like, man, we could really use this tithe somewhere else. And she's like, no. That, that is off limits. We will do different cell phone plans. We'll do a different type of vacation. We'll go to the park for vacation. We'll do no Christmas presents. We'll do whatever we can, but that belongs to God because it is an honor issue. And I'm so thankful for that accountability because that's what happens when everything is out in the open. There's no secrets. There's no more hiding. So I want to encourage you as a married couple, make sure that you together just speak to each other and just say, man, are we being faithful And maybe you're in a place right now where you're like, man, I haven't been faithful. I haven't been a faithful steward. This is what I love about grace. It's not about a dollar amount. God already knows, but he just wants to see you take the next step. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't even have to be a big step. It could just be something. And just say, God, I don't have much. I don't know where this is going to come from. I've been spending it on this, but man, I just want to be faithful to you. And so as the band comes up, I have one last verse to to show you, which I love so much because this reminds me of my grandpa when I was growing up. My grandpa was one of my heroes when he was alive and we thought we were rich. I thought they were rich. I was like, man, they paid for everything. We would go to Disneyland. They had an amusement park called Magic Mountain. They don't have that around here, but they do. We, he would pay for everything. My Chicago family would come in. There'd be 25 people around the table. They, they'd be fighting for the ticket. Like, I was like, wow, they just must be loaded. Like, I didn't, I didn't have a concept of money as a kid. I finally got my first job and I worked at In-N-Out Burger. You guys don't know what that is, but In-N-Out Burger, it's an amazing burger place. And I remember coming over, I was feeling good. I got my first check. It was for $100 at uh, in Alberta, I felt like I worked like 90 hours to get that hundred dollars. I was like so proud. I was strolled into my grandpa's mobile home. I was like, what's up grandpa? And he was sitting down. He had this old piece of paper and this thing in his hand called a pencil. I don't know. Nobody knows what that is anymore. And he was just writing down. He said, come here, son. And I was like, oh, he called me son when he was serious. I was like, what's up grandpa? He's like, what do you see here? I say, I, I see all your bills. He's like, what's the very first thing that you see at the top? I said, that's That says tithe. He's like, what's the second one? I said, missions. And everything else is all his bills. He's like, this is is the thing that I want to leave you that you'll remember when you have a family someday is if you'll trust God with the first, he'll take care of the rest. Because there was a time when we came off the boats from Italy and we landed in Chicago at seven years old. We didn't have nothing. We didn't have a house He didn't even have a a mom and a dad. They didn't have anything. And he remembered telling God, man, if I give you my life, I'm all in. 
and he had tears streaming down his face. Man, I miss him so much. He just said, there was a time I didn't even have grandkids to take care of. And I told God, man, I'm just, I'm going to give you the first and you'll take care of me. And he always has. In this last verse, as we begin to sing this song, this last song together, it says this, Exodus 13, 14, so it shall be when your son asks you in the time to come, saying, what is this? And, you'll sh- and then you shall say to him, by the strength of the hand of the Lord brought us out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. This is what he's saying. One day your kid's gonna ask, why do you tithe? Why do we give this much? And you're gonna say to him, there was a time we didn't have anything. Man, there was a time where we had a, I made some bad decisions and man, we were just messed up financially. And then man, we were at the end of our road, but man, God was faithful to our family. And so I wanna challenge you, dad. I wanna challenge you, mom. I wanna challenge you, single. I wanna challenge you, teenager. Man, if you will just be faithful with the first and you will seek him first, man, it changes from a have to to a get to.